college, I decided to join a gym. And I was a little nervous because I was afraid they wouldn't have enough equipment for my upper body. And I decided to go on a tour of a local gym with a very nice gentleman and asked him if they had equipment specifically for arms. Well, he looked at me and he said, yeah, we got some stuff for arms, but you don't even have to do your arms. You could do a full leg day. Well, of course, I'm sitting there thinking, oh, but should I tell him? Well, the very non-confrontational side of me decided not to say anything, so I ended up spending the next 30 minutes doing a tour of the full spectrum of leg presses, after which he looked at me and said, your legs are going to get nice and beefy, just you wait. Well, I'm still waiting, <laughs> but the problem is so many people are scared to ask those with disabilities what exactly they're able to do or how exactly they're able to help them because they don't want to say the wrong thing. And the problem is this causes so many misconceptions and these small misconceptions compound into large scale societal issues that can drastically affect the lives of millions with disabilities. So I'm here today to show a major insight that I have had through my journey and how I believe it can create a more inclusive future for us all. Now the crazy thing is, I didn't really even think about the concept of disability for most of my childhood. And so the first time that I did think about it is very vivid in my mind. I was watching a movie late at night with my younger sister and it was about this little boy in a wheelchair. And she fell asleep halfway through the movie, but I stayed up awake that night thinking about this little boy and what he must be going through. And I thought to myself, wow, that must suck. I am so glad that's not me. Well, exactly one week later to the day, my mom and I were in a car accident. And a week after the accident, I woke up in a hospital from a coma and had no idea where I was, I couldn't move my legs, and I was absolutely terrified. And a few days later in the ICU, after finding out that my injury was permanent, I looked at my mom and I said, Mommy, I'm not Madeline anymore. And it's like my 10 year old self had this very strong sense that the loss of part of my body meant a loss of my sense of self. And even at such a young age, I felt an instinct that I was no longer worthy to fit into the tribe anymore, that I didn't belong. So let me ask you this. If you were to be in an accident tonight and become paralyzed, what would be your biggest fear going back into your life? The obvious thing to say would be a loss of freedom of movement or the weight of the physical barriers around you. But nobody prepares you for the feeling of going back to school and watching all of your classmates play on the playground while you sit on the sidelines. Or being in a job interview and having the manager tell you that they can't hire you because you can't physically do the job. Or even being on a date and having an accident in the guy's car and being so humiliated that you fake spill a drink on yourself just so you can avoid any super awkward first date explanations. Not that this happened to me or anything, but the core of these experiences mimics the feeling I had after waking up in the hospital, the feeling of shame, the feeling of not belonging anymore. I recently asked the same question I asked you to my social media network about what would you do if you became paralyzed? What would you be afraid of? And some of the answers truly surprised me. People said things like being afraid of losing friends and family because of the disability, what would my purpose in life be with my career and life changing so drastically? People seeing me as disabled and that I can't do anything. That no one would love me. Who would want to be in a relationship with someone who represented such a huge responsibility? After reading these comments, I became a little curious. So I went to my boyfriend and I asked him the same question. And keep in mind, we have been together for three years, so he knows everything about what it's like to be paralyzed. But he looked at me and he said, I'd be afraid that you'd leave me. Of course. I was like, wait, wait a second. You would be afraid that I would leave you if you were paralyzed? And he said, yes, 
I wouldn't be able to take care of you the same, and that would absolutely kill me. When I asked this question, I expected people to focus on the physical and environmental challenges of using a wheelchair. But what I didn't expect was for people to so deeply empathize with this sense of shame, of not fitting back to your community. And the interesting thing is that I felt this sense of shame was validated in my life when I went back into my community. There were members of my family who said that they didn't feel comfortable being around me anymore because of my injury. When I went back to my private school, they said that they didn't feel comfortable having me there as a student anymore because of the challenges that I posed. We even went back to church and they brought me up to the front and took my hands and told me if I had enough faith, I'd be able to stand. Well, as you can probably imagine, I was not able to stand. And so they said that my injury must be a punishment from God. And looking back now, I can clearly see that if these people are able to say things like that to a, a young girl who's recently injured, then they're probably going through some pretty dark things in their own life. But I didn't know that at the time. I didn't know that their reaction was based on the fear of the different and unknown. I thought that I was the problem. And so it was, it was like that I was in this perfect bubble and I had no idea that my acceptance into this bubble was so conditional. And that the second I became flawed, the bubble popped. Now, as I grew older and became more independent, I decided I was going to escape not only the physical barriers around me, but the attitudinal ones. I wanted to find what it took to achieve true accessibility in society, not just with ramps and elevators, but with the things that you can't measure, a place where you're free from the shame of being different. And so it became my mission that I was going to prove to myself and to everyone around me that I was worthy of acceptance and that I didn't have to be ashamed. So one of my first adventures was flying to Germany. And of course, on this first big step outside of my comfort zone, they briefly misplaced my wheelchair. And I can tell you there is no more terrifying prospect than flying to a foreign country for the first time, completely alone, wheelchairless. I also decided to climb the mountain beside Mount Rushmore. I had met this amazing park ranger and his wife who brought me into their home. They trained me on a ranger climbing course and helped me to ascend the 200 foot mountainside. They even decided to go swimming with sharks, thought it was going to be in a cage, but they took us out in the middle of the ocean, pushed us out of the boat, and no cage was offered. So when we were training for the shark swim, they said not to kick our legs too much or else the sharks might think we're seals. And I was like, yes, I got this. <laughs> well, there was still one shark that was quite interested in me. And before I knew it, I looked down and it was jutting up toward me, mouth open, rows of teeth. And all I could think of in that moment was, please just go for the legs. Go for the legs. <laughs> Luckily, it didn't come to that. But... I uh, was able to continue on into pageantry. And I can assure you, it was so much scarier than the shark thing. But I was continuing this goal of challenging the question of belonging. Could someone like me with a very obvious physical disability fit in in a part of society that tends to so harshly judge people for their physical form? Well, after years of pushing boundaries and testing my limits, I came to a very surprising realization that there are times in my life when I am dependent on others. There are times in my life when I'm completely independent, but it wasn't necessarily the independent times when that shame went away. It was the times when I was able to work interdependently with others. It was when I was in Germany and my classmates helped me to create a map of all the accessible bathrooms in the town so that I was able to go on my own. But when there were times when my body was ready for immediate action, they were always right there, ready to carry me. And it was the time when I worked with the park rangers. They had never trained a paraplegic for that kind of climb before. But together, we worked out tricks for me 
to be able to use my arms instead of my legs to work around the sharp rocks that I would encounter on my climb. And it was the time in pageantry when I was the first girl in a wheelchair to ever make top five in a Miss USA state pageant and was able to work with people around the country and around the world to create campaigns to redefine traditional beauty standards. And after this awareness of what interdependence can do, I was getting so excited, but I realized that we don't necessarily live in a society that focuses on interdependence for people with disabilities. There are options for people to become dependent on our government, on caregivers, and then there are also options for people to become independent because of incredible disability laws and initiatives. But the problem is when you create a society that forces people with a limited ability to either perform at full capacity or not perform at all, you inevitably create a system that shames those who are different. Because if you force them to perform at full capacity, the disability will at some point come into play and they'll have an environment of criticism and shame. But if you don't allow them to perform at all, they'll feel like they're not contributing to society and that they have no purpose in life. But when you're able to use this tool of interdependence, that fear and shame of being different begin to melt away. And interdependence at its core is when two or more people are able to work together to create the best outcome possible with all of the assets at hand. And if we're able to use this tool on a national scale, it could drastically affect the way that our society sees people with disabilities and how people with disabilities see themselves. Employers wouldn't think of undue hardship when hiring those with disabilities, but instead would think about the amazing assets that they could bring to their company. Businesses wouldn't be afraid to create customized services for those with disabilities because they would realize they could have a solution-based mindset instead of simply saying, there's nothing we could do. Governments would rethink their policies for those with disabilities because they'd realize that they shouldn't punish those who want to work to the extent of their ability, even if they can't work full time. And people, people would begin to destigmatize those who are different because they would realize that we all have disabilities. We all have weaknesses. And this journey of life is not meant to be walked or wheeled alone, that we need to come together to carry each other's burdens and to help build each other up to be the best we can be through our weaknesses. Today marks the 17 year anniversary of my car accident. And I wanted to give this talk, not only to honor my journey and my transformation, but to also show that my challenges can be used for something good and that we can create a transformation in society to where we can look at all humans, no matter how they're packaged, as equal members of society and that our abilities together can be so much more powerful than they could ever be apart.